In recent weeks, Ukraine has started using harm missiles to take down Russian air defenses. Yet with only older Soviet-made aircraft in its air force, that shouldn't be possible. So how did they do it? Well, it turns out you can blame it on Top Gun. It seems like almost every day that another Russian airbase, ammunition depot, or bridge gets knocked out. Each time, just before the targets are hit, a series of well-timed harm missile strikes take down Russia's air defenses. Those missiles are American-made. With a range of around 150 kilometers, Ukraine's pilots can launch them from beyond the range of most Russian air defense systems. Once launched, the missiles fly toward their selected targets usually Russian air defense radar sites, then lock in on the radar signal, fly down the beam, and hit the target. Even if a Russian operator were to spot an incoming missile and try to turn off their radar, the missile remembers where it was and hits precisely there anyway. Since it flies at nearly Mach 2, or about 2,500 kilometers per hour, there's little warning anyway. As a result, the Harm missile is a game changer in this war. It's what allows Ukraine to successfully carry out so many deep strikes, even against the best defended Russian targets. However, there's a mystery here. While we know that Ukraine is using harm missiles, we don't know how. All of their older Soviet-built aircraft don't have the right electronics for it. In other words, you can't just hang a missile under the wing of any airplane and expect it to work. The aircraft has to have a compatible data bus, a special mission targeting computer, the right in-cockpit displays, and even a lot more than that. The fact is, for a Ukrainian MiG to launch that missile would require the original Russian electronics be replaced with the right Western kit. That's a job that would take years of engineering to complete, and yet this war is only in its sixth month. Regardless, we see conclusive evidence that Ukraine is using harm missiles. The Russians have even recovered twisted bits and bent pieces of missile fins that were buried amidst the burning wreckage of some of their radar sites. When they published photos of those online, it kicked off a global debate on how Ukraine was doing it. At first, many believed that the photos were faked, but then a week later, the Pentagon's Undersecretary of Defense for Policy confirmed that the U.S. was supplying Ukraine with harm missiles after all. He added that Ukraine was firing their missiles from MiGs. Yet nobody believed that, because it was well known that the engineering required to make that possible couldn't have been done so quickly. What followed was speculation that NATO was secretly supplying Ukraine with a type of Western aircraft capable of launching those missiles. Yet Ukrainian pilots would have needed to train to fly and operate those in combat, and to get that knowledge would take at least a year. Even if a handful of retired U.S. Air Force pilots volunteered to fly those planes on Ukraine's behalf, it still couldn't have happened. Quite simply, it takes more than just a pilot to fly an airplane. You need the ground crews, the maintenance, the hangars, the spare parts, and everything else that goes along with flying a modern, complex warplane. As a result, the debate shifted next to whether NATO was secretly flying a campaign of harm missile strikes on Ukraine's behalf. While technically possible, it made no sense. The Alliance was avoiding any direct involvement in the war, and to do so seemed to needlessly risk kicking off World War III. And for what? A few radar sites? Having exhausted all other ideas, the armchair analysts finally postulated that Ukraine might be launching harm missiles from trucks or from some kind of modified armored fighting vehicle. As it happens, some variants of the harm missile can be launched that way, so it almost made sense. Except for one thing. From the front line, a missile launched from the ground wouldn't have the range to reach some of the targets being hit. That meant that Ukraine was launching missiles from its airplanes. But how? The answer came a few days ago. It turns out that Raytheon had done what was previously thought impossible. As it happened, the armchair observers weren't wrong in their assessment. The task of engineering Western electronics onto Russian airplanes had required years to complete. What nobody knew, however, was that that work had already been done decades ago. And for that, 
you can thank Top Gun. Of course, when I say Top Gun, I don't mean Tom Cruise in Hollywood. I mean the real Top Gun and the U.S. Air Force's own red flag program. Do you remember Viper and his buddy Jester from the movie? Their job was to take the place of enemy pilots and fly in mock dogfights. They're assigned to what are called aggressor squadrons, and they're among the best pilots in the entire military. They provide very advanced training, and in fact, no effort is spared to make the experience as much like real war and as realistic as possible. How realistic, you may wonder? Well, during the Cold War, that realism was taken all the way. At that time, the U.S. Department of Defense ran programs to secretly acquire, evaluate, and ultimately fly a wide range of Russian aircraft. Those programs were known by various code names, like Constant Peg, Have Idea, Have Pad, and incredibly, one was even called Have Donut. Each program worked with a different aircraft. Early on, they had MiG-17s. Then later, they added MiG-21s, MiG-23s, as well as Sukhoi-17s and 22s. Ultimately, they even had MiG-29s and Su-27s. Some were captured, others were secretly recovered from little-known crash sites, a few were purchased on the black market, and some came from defecting East Bloc pilots. Finally, there were even several snatch-and-grab operations performed by special forces. The U.S. military did whatever it took to get what it needed to stay ahead of the game. Of course, those programs were considered very costly. Each plane was worth its weight in gold, a national asset that was virtually irreplaceable. Ultimately, however, all that changed when in 1991, the flag went down on the Soviet Union. Suddenly, it was like the floodgates opened. There was a fire sale of old Soviet equipment from across all of Eastern Europe. Former Warsaw Pact countries were simply done with their Russian planes. It was like a bonanza for Western intelligence. You could get whatever you needed with a single phone call. In fact, during that time, a few private warbird enthusiasts went over to Russia with cash in hand and simply bought themselves a real MiG to fly as their own. East Germany provided a whole squadron of MiG-29s, and those became a regular fixture at Top Gun and Red Flag. The fact was, even if the Soviet Union was no more, most of the potential future adversaries of the U.S. and NATO were still flying Russian aircraft. In all, the United States flew Russian airplanes for more than four decades. Thus, as unbelievable as it sounds, that meant that Top Gun was really the solution to Ukraine's harm missile challenge. Since Raytheon was the contractor that supported those old Russian aircraft, its engineers knew everything there was to know about a MiG-29. They had completed most of the complex engineering required to replace Russian electronics with Western kit. Thus, Raytheon simply called in some of its engineers and put them onto the project. In the end, instead of several years, the job of equipping Ukraine's MiG-29s with harm missiles was done in a few months. Then, the only thing left to do was to train Ukraine's pilots on the launch sequence, a job done in just a couple of weeks. Ukraine's use of harm missiles in combat marks a major turning point in this war. In fact, it's every bit as important as the delivery of the HIMARS system a few months back. And incredibly, it came down to Top Gun to make it possible. I'm Thomas Van Hare, and this is Historic Wings. Please subscribe and click like. And remember, there's always more to the story.